the sky Rising in the air There's a feeling so strong It's time to light the fire Like a bright shining light Learn Getting more out of life Love Sharing time with friends Feeling so strong Hello and welcome to the House of Wellness. I'm Luke Darcy and I'm very happy as always to be here alongside my good friend Joe Stanley. Hello, Joe. Darcy, it's always awesome to be here with you. And while we're all still staying well apart, because I can't remember the last time I even shook someone's hand, it feels weird to think about it now, it's really feeling so great right now. It's got a vibe of norm normality that I kind of vaguely remember from the start of this year. Well, how quickly we do forget, Joe, but this new sense of freedom is coinciding with some great weather. So what better a way to kick things off than with something innovative that's designed around the sun, a revolutionary new body scanner that detects skin cancer. I was lucky enough to try one of just three of these scanners in Australia. Plus, we'll look at ways to navigate our kids through anxiety. But first, South Australia continues to lead the nation in the fight against single-use plastics. It's the first state to ban plastic straws, drink stirrers and cutlery, which will all be outlawed as of next year. In 2022, polystyrene cups, bowls, plates and containers will also be banned, Joe, which is sensational. Well done to South Australia. It really is. It's a huge win for our marine life. And here we go with the numbers again, but they are significant. Eight million tonnes of plastic end up in our oceans every year. And 80% of that starts on the land and washes in through gutters and drains. The worst things are shopping bags, cutlery and straws, balloons and plastic bottles. So it's how to stop garbage getting to the ocean in the first place. And until we find more ways to do this, a couple of marine lovers have come up with a brilliant solution. They've invented sea bins, which are literally rubbish bins for the ocean. On a glorious day like this, I can't help wondering how much debris is floating in Sydney's spectacular harbour. Hey, Tom. Hey, Luke. How's it going? Good to see you. Yeah, you too. Tom Petroni has the answer. He's a passionate environmentalist and has been pulling out rubbish from the harbour bin by bin. So how many of these have you got around Sydney? We've got 15. We put in the 16th one today. Oh, nice. Yeah, so there's a few. We're getting up there. The sea bin project is the brainchild of Pete Zaglinski. Pete, tell us about the sea bin project. How did you come up with the idea? Well, technically it was my business partner, Andrew, and um, he had the idea of if you've if you got rubbish bins on land, why don't we put them in the water? And so when he told me, like, for me, that was the light bulb moment. I was like, you know, I can, I can do this. Oh, it's looking full. Was that full? That's pretty full. That's a good little catch. You know, if you, if you can imagine a pool skimmer or two garbage bins, we put one here, we put one there, mm. and then we have a pump at the bottom. When we skim, we only skim the top, so like 10 millimetres of the surface. All the plastic floats, so it stays on the surface, and then the water passes through the filter. The plastic stops in the filter, and when it's full, you know, we, we have our enviro technician to come along, and they change it. We, uh, we clean out the filter, we put it back in, and we keep going. And so we're literally filtering 600,000 litres of water a day for oil, fuel, microplastics, microfibres. The amount of waste collected in each bin is, uh, it can be up to 30 or 40 kilos for each filter. And then, so if you change that three or four times, then you, you know, you're getting like 100, 120 kilos a day. But the global average that we have is about four kilos. But then you think about it, like plastic doesn't weigh anything. And if you've got four kilos of plastic, that's a lot. What's that? Foamy rubber stuff. Yep. The bins are collecting more than just garbage. Every piece of rubbish is documented to collect important data. Polly, this is the worst stuff because that just breaks up into 10 bits of rubbish. Yep. The data is really exciting and really powerful because, for example, during this global pandemic, um, we're finding a lot of face masks, a lot of gloves. So it's a great indication and it's awesome information that we can share with the government so we can sort of prove how much of this rubbish is in the water. And that's where we can make a real difference. Worldwide, there are over 1,000 sea bins operational in 53 countries. While that seems a lot, it really is only a drop in the ocean. People were like rejoicing that we got this garbage can that is supposedly going to fix our problems. 
and we're like, well, no, you know, the technology is not going to solve an issue like this. And I was like, we have the power of communication, so what is the real solution? And everything boiled back down to education. So we just, like, charged into this big, you know, educational program with no idea what we're doing. But we, we have a pretty kick-ass, you know, educational program happening in, in more than 20 countries. So, yeah, it's, it's cool, and that's the real solution. But in the meantime, these bins are making a difference, and so are the people behind it. Oh, it's, it's awesome. You know, you, you can have a purpose with your life, with your job, your career. You know, you've you got cleaner water, and it's just, it feels great that you can help others, help the environment, and, uh, you know, just, just feel good about it all. The Seabin Project collects more than 3,500 kilos of garbage from the world's oceans every single day, Joe. Unbelievable. The Australian Marine Conservation Society also has an online petition calling for all governments to follow South Australia's lead and ban single-use plastics. Head to their website to add your voice to the growing global call for change. Speaking of law reform, last week we mentioned another headline-making development in the wellness sector, and that is medicinal cannabis, Joe. Since 2016, medicinal cannabis can be prescribed in Australia via a registered health practitioner to help people suffering chronic pain or conditions such as epilepsy and autism. Doctors and patients who see the life-changing benefits of this treatment are calling for laws to be relaxed even more. Next year, Australians may be able to access CBD oil without a prescription. Spearheading the push for that to happen is Sydney-based company Bod Australia, who develop and make medicinal cannabis products. They're currently recruiting to take part in a 12-month observational study of the drug. We are running this um, observational study. Um, people who are, or patients who are having a chronic conditions, including chronic pain, anxiety, such as PTSD, dementia, autism, or basically any other chronic conditions that they have exhausted other treatment options. They are eligible if they are 18 years and over. Recruitment is open nationwide um, with this study running for up to 12 months. And how do people go about applying? So what you need to do, you can visit um, um, our website about pharmaceuticals and there are more information that you can um, consult with your doctor and then um, basically you might be eligible and be participating in the study. What are you hoping to achieve with this trial? So the study basically assess the uh, benefits of um, BOTS medic medicabalis, which is an intoxicating form of the medicinal cannabis. It already has shown significant relief for many patients. So we are hoping that by um, in recruiting patients systematically, we can provide uh, more information um, that uh, we can gather all this information and use them um, for the community, for the medical community. Up next, the scanner set to revolutionise the way we shop for avocados. Back after this on the House of Wellness. back to the House of Wellness. Now, Joe, you might be surprised, but I actually am a big fan of doing the grocery shopping. Really? Yeah, I am. I like doing it. Um, it's something that uh, I, uh, I've got the place that we go to every week and I uh, fancy myself a little bit in the shops. So I'm okay. quite happy to do it. Uh, happy to do it with Beck, but uh, very happy in there and just like sort of, you know, pottering around. Okay, so this is what I predict, because I am, I'm a, I make a list, I get in and I get out. I don't no list Wander for me. around. Okay, no, I can see I don't you. Take on board a list. You disappear for hours on end and then come back with completely useless things. Maybe <laughs> go and get a bit of lunch first, turn <laughs> it into a, an outing. But very, very happy to get involved in the supermarket shopping. What about Daz? Yeah, he he disappears and then he comes back with food that's not on the list. <laughs> and I'm like, what on earth are you doing with three pineapples? We don't even eat pineapples. <laughs> You know, like, I get it. I think, yeah, I think men enjoy a bit of a wander, whereas I'm in and out, and now I would add to the supermarket people not wearing masks. I don't like that. I don't like the fact that people are picking things up and putting it back. I don't, I, <laughs> I don't like the queues. I don't like the, the car park. And one of my biggest food annoyances is the avocado. Now, I'm with you on this. There is nothing worse than when you... You're so excited to get into your biscuits and your goat's cheese and then you open up your avocado and it's ugh, just a big brown blob. 
Well, no, all that good. squeezing of an avocado takes its toll, Joe, as I found out. They say that, on average, a single avocado is squeezed or touched by at least four people before you bring oh. it home, which... Yeah. It's not ideal. No, no, it's not good. <laughs> but in an Australian first, a West Australian company has come up with an avocado scanner that can tell if the fruit is bruised before it hits the shops. The brilliant innovation is the brainchild of Delroy Orchards. Susie Delroy has the lowdown on this amazing new technology and how to pick the perfect avocado. The brown avocado is something that no one wants to uh, experience. T tell us what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. So we know how disappointing it is to get your avocados home and cut into them only to discover that they're bruised. Uh, so what we've done is we've installed sort of X-ray-like technology into our packing line, which basically checks the insides of the avocados for any uh, bruises or blemishes prior to them going to the supermarkets. It's not a literal X-ray. Um, you don't have to worry about radiation or anything, but it's actually near-infrared technology and it uses light to analyse the dry matter of the fruit, basically, and check for any defects inside. And can automatically, you know, divert anything that looks to be damaged on the inside so that only the, you know, perfectly clean avocados go into the supermarkets. Now, I'm guilty, Susan, I don't have to confess, of uh, being in the supermarket and giving the avocado a decent squeeze because we're all trying to find that perfect one. And I'm told that, on average, Four other people have, uh, have squeezed my avocado before I take it home, which I'm, I'm mildly disturbed by. Um, are you saying that uh, if you can use your scanning technology, there's no need for us to do that? Yeah, look, so the idea is that you know that it's not bruised, so you don't need to go and feel for any soft spots. All you need to do as the customer is um, pick your avocado based on the colour of the skin, which will tell you how ripe it is, so you don't need to squeeze it. Yeah, and I suppose that must uh, break your heart as an avocado-growing family, Susie, to have uh, people coming along in supermarkets. And, and, and does it actually do damage if, you know, if many people go through and squeeze an avocado? I'm assuming that's not great for the fruit. Yeah, look, that's where about 90% of the bruising actually occurs in avocados is on the shelf when people pick them up and squeeze them. So if we could just get people to, to choose their avocado based on the, you know, the colour of the skin for ripeness rather than squeezing them and feeling for bruising, et cetera... Um, it will really eliminate the whole the whole issue. Um, now, to be you know to be extra sure, you can give them a very gentle squeeze right at the tip, just to make sure it's it's soft and ready. But just as long as that's not squeezing all over the avocado. So you've given these new avocados a distinct name. Can you tell me what it is? Yeah. So uh, we've called them Delcados. Um, obviously, our surname is Delroy, so just a bit of a blend there <laughs> from Delroy and avocado. Um, so, yeah, basically, if you see a Delcado sticker in the shop, you know that that avocado should be guaranteed, no bruises inside. And uh, what's the best way to eat an avocado, Susie? How do, you, uh, how do you serve them for yourself? Me, personally, I just love an avocado on toast with a bit of feta, a bit of lemon juice. Is it in the blood? Are you, are you an avocado farmer for life, Susie? Is that your, your uh, next stage? I think once you've grown up on an avocado farm, there's no going back. <laughs> All we need now is technology that can stop people sorting through the mushrooms <laughs> and the cherries. You know, I've seen people literally rifle through the cherries. No, no, just pick from the top. That's what it's for. <laughs> You've got a real issue with that, and fair enough, too. <laughs> now, Joe, one man who never messes with food in the wrong way is our own Heinzy, and here he is putting a healthy twist into an Aussie icon. It's getting closer to summer, and there's nothing I love more to stay refreshed and hydrated than an ice cold smoothie. Today I'll be tailoring a smoothie for the ladies and of course a smoothie for the men with the help from the Vital team who have come up with an incredible range of vegan friendly protein supplements that uses the highest quality European pea protein. So let's see it in action. Ladies first of course, so I'm going to start with some frozen raspberry and some frozen pink dragon fruit pieces which are going to give it a really pink colour and give off those summer vibes. Now, along with summer and all the fun that comes along with sitting by the pool and going to the beach, a lot of people's priority is to manage their weight in a healthy way. And the Vital Slim and Trim Protein can help with just that. What I love about it is that it contains protein, which obviously helps keep us feeling fuller for longer, but it also contains weight loss supporting ingredients such as L-carnitine and thermogenic spices such as ginger, turmeric and cayenne pepper. Now, these are all designed to boost your metabolism, assist with long-term weight management and curb those sneaky cravings. Time to get blitzing. Check this out. It's health without compromising on flavour. 
Cheers to that, ladies. Now it's the guy's turn. This choc chip thick shake is healthier than the OG due to the avocado, the raw cacao, and of course the bananas. They're packed with vitamins and minerals. Now I'm sure there's a lot of guys out there like me who like to look after their muscles all year round, but in particular in summer. And the Vital Performance Protein has us covered. It helps with muscle function and muscle recovery after exercise, thanks to the inclusion of L-glutamine, manganese, magnesium, and tart cherry. So these are all ingredients that reduce muscle soreness, build muscle tissue, reduce inflammation, and support the pain from exercise. The good news is this powdered supplement is perfect for pre or post workout. Well, there you have it, guys and girls, a smoothie for each of you. But if you're smoothie crazy like me, why not just have both? I'm off to the pool. The A to Z of Vitamins is brought to you by Vital Protein Formula, a unique vegan protein blend used to assist with exercise recovery support and to support long-term weight management. Now, summer's only a week or so away, and that means time to stock up on the sunscreen. We've had a few warmish days in Melbourne, and there is a real sting in the sun, so it can be very easy to get burnt, as we know. Jo? Oh, Darcy, I can't tell you. I am absolutely rigid and obsessive with my sunscreen, and yet every year, at least once, I forget and I get burnt. There's no excuse. I get so cross at myself, but it can happen so easily. And around two in three Aussies will be diagnosed with skin cancer by the time they're 70. And the biggest cause is exposure to the sun. The sooner a skin cancer is identified and treated, the better your chance of avoiding surgery or worse. So, Das, do you get yourself checked regularly? Well, I'm embarrassed to say no, Jo. And uh, given uh, I'm you know, reasonably fair with an mm. Irish sort of background, probably something I should do. So I'm very interested in the, this technology, Jo, and yeah. I'm up for doing it. I'm going to put it on my list. Well, I do get checked regularly and I've been fortunate enough that I haven't found anything of concern just yet, but I'm well on top of the fight. And the fight against skin cancer has gone to a whole new level with a revolutionary full body scanner. There's just three of these machines in the country that are being used for research purposes with high-risk patients. And I was fortunate enough to treat my skin and my health to a broad test of one of them. So, Joe, please uh, come in. And, uh, Joe, if you wouldn't mind then to get rid of your, okay. yeah, just to put it here mm -hmm. and then uh, walk in here. And uh, please stand accordingly. So, use these footprints. Mm -hmm. And in regard to your hands, if you just do it like, yes, like this, like, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. Peter, how much of a game changer is this machine? To be honest, I think this is a significant game changer because as you have seen, you walk in and your total body is, is imaged and this will allow us to really detect your melanoma, your potential melanoma, much, much earlier. Mm -hmm. With this frame, we have 92 cameras, 92 Canon cameras, which are basically shooting all within a second. And the image to be build up this 3D avatar of your body, this takes uh, about 13 minutes. But then we have basically your whole body with all the body surface, and we can then zoom in and have a very great uh, view of, of all your moles and all your blemishes and all your skin lesions. <laughs> That is very confronting. <laughs> Let's go to your upper arm. You know, what we call the outer aspect of your upper arm, and mm -hmm. we see that you have here a, a few moles, which is actually quite typical that um, on this body side, women have quite a few moles. Having said this, all your moles are absolutely fine. Mm. And then, of course, we can also turn you around and... Uh, Wait a moment. I, I show it to you like like this. Great. This. Currently, it's being used in research and with high-risk patients. How long do you think before it will be readily available to the wider public? Yeah, I think this is a very good question. With this new grant from the Australian Cancer Research Foundation, we will very soon have 15 machines across the eastern seaport and probably more in, in the years to come. And we are starting a so-called melanoma cohort study where we want to recruit high-risk people, but also people with medium risk and low risk people. And we want to, to basically do the world's first and largest study for the detection of melanoma. 
You will also see now that you, we see that you don't have too many moles on your inner side of the upper arms. And you see that how this is related to, to, the, uh, to the pigmentation and to, to oh, the yeah. sun damage. Yeah. And, and so we can obviously look through your whole uh, body and, uh, and make an assessment of your moles. But you can imagine this would be work also very good with rashes or with other skin conditions. Yes, yes. Peter, you've been working in the field of skin cancer for decades. Yeah. Are we winning the battle against skin cancer here in Australia? Yes, Australia is really, I, I, I like to see it like this, Australia is the best place to do research in this field. It's no doubt that Australia is leading the world in primary prevention of melanoma, there's no play policy and, and there are quite a few others. But generally also now in the last years with the immunotherapy of melanoma, we are starting to win the battle against melanoma. Not every battle, but it's, it's mm. getting very, very close to it. And so there's really a good time now to also work, in, increase the work on the early, on the early detection. Yeah. So uh, you didn't see anything of concern no, there? No, no. You are very skin healthy. Congratulations. This is good to know. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes. So there you are, Das. My skin is all clear. Yes. My moles are looking good. I'm very pleased they saved you and everyone from the extreme close-up of my face. Because <laughs> I look like a, I had a man's moustache. Was it a bit, That's all I'm a bit confronting the, uh, the full body scan? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought you were looking great, Joe. Summer's also the season where we start getting back into shape and getting out and doing some more exercise as well, Joe. Well, there is that saying that summer bodies are made in winter, and I'd say that lockdown was a great opportunity to start because we had the time, right? But it's never too late to start a healthy exercise regime to tone up your entire body, including the 43 hard working muscles in your face. While gymnasiums are full of people eager to build and tone their bodies, of the 600 muscles in the body that get a workout, there's one important group that gets left behind. We've got over 43 muscles in our face and we use these for everything from how we eat, how we breathe and especially how we express ourselves, smile, frown, etc. Generally we don't go out of our way to exercise our facial muscles, you know. We go out of our way to go for a run, to go to the gym, but we don't set out at the start of each day to go, I'm going to exercise my cheek muscles. All muscles lose mass over time as we age and so we can do exercises to, you know, keep them healthy um, and keep the skin tone as a result, you know, much stronger and, you know, firmer, plumper and keep the wrinkles out of our skin. Nathan Healy is part of a research and development team investigating how to best stimulate facial muscles. What we can do to exercise the facial muscles is just basically repeated movement. Right, so you can use either your fingers or a tool, you know, to just get those muscles continually moving again. Electronic muscle stimulation or EMS, it is a method of using small microcurrents to just repeatedly contract the muscles in the face. The results we have found that using EMS daily actually does have a significant effect on the tone, the firmness and the, um, the, the appearance of the skin. So my face, before I started using any EMS on my face, was like a bumpy pillow. So this Nova Fit is basically like you're fluffing up and smoothing out your pillow. For makeup artist and social media influencer Uzi, flawless, toned and youthful skin is part of the job description. You can use your Nova Fit during the day and the night and you can use it five days and then take two days off, so five, two. So just like how you work out, so you basically start from your jaw, you just work your way up, and then you work from the side of your mouth. So it's three times, and then you go up to your forehead and over your brow towards your hairline. And you also have to work from your clavicle, your decolletaging clavicle. And I like to use the EMS in the morning, sort of like wake up workout, and the relax mode in the night to like, sort of like switch off, cool down. Fitness to me is simply self-care. It goes head to toe, so you don't go neck down. <laughs> you don't just skip this part. <laughs> so yeah, it's very important to me.
going to show you how easy it is to apply your base. And the Glam by Manicare Pro Series Makeup Brushes make a big difference. So we're going to start with the Glam Pro Blending Foundation Brush. I love that these brushes don't absorb too much of the product. My favourite step is the sculpting stage. So you would use the sculpting brush. It's cut at an angle, but it will get just under your cheekbone. What I love about the Glam Pro brushes are they're made with amazing nano bristles. They're all cruelty free and it feels so soft and really gentle on the skin. This time we're going to use the Glam Pro highlighting brush. And when you're highlighting, it's any of the areas of your face that you would like to bring forward. So the top of our cheekbones, our nose, Cupid's bow. And now on to our final step using the Glam Pro setting powder brush. Pop the powder or the brush directly into your translucent or compact powder. Dust off a little and then lightly dust any areas you want to avoid that shine. My most asked question is, how many times should I clean my brushes? I would say after every use, but a bare minimum once a week. A product that I love is the Glam Pro Instant Brush Sanitizer. It cleans your brush, but it also sanitizes it so there's no germs. Rubber tissue and simply a few sprays and then with your brush, just back and forth, and it will get rid of all the colour. And voila, it's all clean and ready to go. As we know, Joe, one of the hardest things about the 2020 lockdown was the stress and anxiety it brought to our kids. Forcing them to stay home and be separated from their mates for weeks or months on end was something all parents struggled with as we did as well. The Kids Foundation educates kids and their families on how to navigate major life events like the pandemic. It's produced a new picture book of fun and practical ideas on how to fight viral bugs and ward off the worries, weighing all too heavily on all of our youngsters' tiny shoulders. Right. Now, I can spot another chicken. No, I'm making a blue. You're making a blue friend. Every year, the Kids Foundation mascot, Seymour Safety, teaches 400,000 kids across Australia how to protect themselves from injuries. Um, Seymour Safety makes us be safe and do the right thing. So it's no surprise that when a new safety threat hit Australia, kindergarten teachers everywhere turned to Kids Foundation CEO, Dr Susie O'Neill. When COVID first happened, we had a number of kindergarten teachers that phoned us and said, um, have you got anything that would help the children understand about bugs, viral bugs, and um, anything that might ease the anxiety that's been caused around it? And we hadn't. So that night I went and wrote the book. Within just two weeks, the Kids Foundation sent copies of the Seymour Bug Safety Book to 10,000 kinders across Australia. For teachers like Nicole Lonigan from the Grove Children's Centre in Coburg, it was an immediate lifesaver. And it's about the tiny little germs we can't see. Can everyone say germs? The book was really important in just like honing in those skills of um, hand washing, um, social distancing and developing those kinds of things that the children had to use. You have to wash your hands for 20 seconds with soap and water. Put your elbow on your nose or end or or on your mouth if you cough or sneeze. So if we go to the grocery shop, we should wash our hands after. If we touch a door handle at the shops, we should wash our hands. Pretty soon they picked it all up and they were answering questions and telling us um, that we should be washing our hands if we were to, you know, touch our faces, telling us to go wash them as well. Should we put our fingers in our mouths? No! Spreading no. It also talks about when they can't see the people that they love the most, ways that they can send little messages and, um, and keep in touch with them. So we can call them on the... Phone. Phone. We could do a FaceTime. During Melbourne's Stage 4 lockdown, most kids weren't allowed to attend childcare, so another 19,000 books were printed for families to read at home. 
including translated editions for kids from non-English speaking backgrounds. We ended up with requests for Swahili, Arabic and um, Chinese. And then since it went out in the Chinese version, we then had a request um, from China saying, look, have you looked at taking this program there? So, um, you know, that, that could be the next step. It's been a tough year, but with the help of Seymour Safety, the kids of Melbourne have safely made it to the other side of lockdown and they couldn't be happier. It's so good because I went to somebody's house. I think they feel a bit of relief. They come here and they're so full of energy and I think that's the lack of being able, um, not being able to go out and you know play as they usually would, see family as they usually would. They have really um, shown a lot of resilience in um, adapting to what's been going on with the changes and the See More Safety initiative has really, yeah, encouraged all of that. Welcome back. Earlier we looked at medicinal cannabis and the push to relax regulations here in Australia. There's another plant that's been used for centuries as a way to relax the mind and it's called kava, Jo. Yeah, kava is made from the ground roots of a shrub that's related to the pepper family that's native to the South Pacific Islands. Traditionally, it's ground or powdered and then soaked in water to become tea in a ceremony to strengthen group ties and help people communicate with spirits. I went to one of these ceremonies when we were in Hawaii last year, Darcy. It was so interesting. Yeah, I remember in Fiji experiencing a bit of kava. It's got a very pungent taste that's not to everyone's liking, but there are other ways to extract its stress-reducing properties as well. Take a look. My anxiety levels were quite high for a good two years. I would wake up having panic attacks and I'd get cramping in the stomach and I would just feel it come up and sit in my chest like a, like a big sumo wrestler. I was just like sitting on my chest and that's how it would feel. Natalie Piscopo is one of two million Australians who experience anxiety. Eager to find a natural solution, she turned to a traditional remedy common in the South Pacific Islands. Kava for me, I had heard about it through a cousin who is studying to be a naturopath and she's like, why don't you try this? So I was willing to give anything a go. I've actually been using kava for about five years. I am a health freak. I uh, love my exercise, but on the flip side, I also love, you know, natural therapies, hence why I do use kava. Kava, for some people's memories, if they've travelled to Fiji and Vanuatu, for example, is that they're used to sort of being that muddy, you know, sort of mouldy tasting uh, water, you know, which they get in the ceremonies. So kava is a South Pacific medicinal plant. Uh, the part of kava which is used is the rootstock, and that is ground up, it's pulverised and then put into water usually, and then the chemical constituents known as kava lactones are drawn out uh, into the water and people will consume those in liquid form, uh, or the carvalactones can be put into capsules or tablets or even tea bags. Professor Jerome Saris is from the NICM Health Research Institute. His studies focus on how plants like kava can be used beyond their cultural purposes. So over the last few decades, uh, the science has realised really how special the kava plant is. We've had an abundance of research. Uh, the majority of it has shown that kava is effective in a large amount of people for reducing their general stress levels, their day-to-day -day anxieties. The physical effects as a result of taking kava, I've noticed is just the calmness and just the, like, uh, you know, just, the relaxation, but even the way you interact in day-to-day -day life. I would be in situations at work or, you know, put in a situation where I'd usually panic. But I found myself just calmer, not that instant, like, that tight chest pain. I think if people stick to the dosage guidelines and use a high-quality kava product and it's appropriate for their health, then I think there's no problem in terms of kava consumption. Don't be ashamed, you know, don't be ashamed of having anxiety. You know, so many people don't talk about it. And it's only, I think, of late the last couple of years, we've really put a 
focus and emphasis have gone into anxiety and different things we can do for it and natural therapies and Carver's just right up there. I hope that everyone gets as much use and comfort from Carver as I did. back. Working out what to feed the family for dinner can be a bit of a minefield, Joe. Beck is quite incredible, I have to admit, so I'm very well looked after on that front. I honestly don't know how she manages to cater for six people and their particular tastes. Mm. Not easy. <laughs> and I uh, like to try and get involved sometimes, Joe, but my skills are very, very limited. I'd like Heinzie to move into our house I and know. solve the whole problem, but that would be... The... I've already bagged him, though. <laughs> so he's coming to my house first. But it's not just the kids who can be fussy eaters. Our pampered pooches now have such a huge variety of different diets on offer, making it just as hard to decide what my Daisy or your Dennis would like. The days of spooning out... A can of Pell a long gone does. I think about what we fed our dog growing up. Literally just scraps from what you <laughs> ate. And then the, you know, the big sloppy tin. That's it. <laughs> Terrible. Well, in the last decade, a lot of pet owners have shifted towards grain-free, homemade and raw diets for their dogs, Joe. A doggy diet of raw, meaty bones and vegetable scraps is nutritious and great for our pooches, but it still has some risks. We caught up with the Jamie Oliver of Canine Cuisine vet, Mark Reeve, to find out how to make Michelin star meals for our mutts. This is Princess, he's a chihuahua and he's two and a half years old. He gets bits, you know, dried food, and uh, he gets some chicken in the evening. And if he's good, he gets a chicken neck. She's a Labrador, she's nearly two. She's being a Labrador, will eat anything, and does eat anything. I normally feed her a Labrador-specific kibble. French Bulldogs tend to have quite sensitive stomachs. So we got something for her that, you know, basically made her tummy a little less upset. If you think the menu for dogs begins and ends with kibble, you've never heard of the BARF diet. Yep, that's B-A-R-F, Biologically Appropriate Raw Food Diet. This is Bert, he's seven months old, and I feed him only natural food. So I actually subscribe to some food suppliers that believe in feeding dogs natural food because it's good for their microbiome and their, and their general health. Picture the perfect plate of human foods in a doggy bowl. High quality, lean protein and plenty of fresh veggies. I find people and what they feed their pet is something they're really passionate about. And we see everything from people who are really strict with feeding a commercial pre-prepared diet through to people who want to do a home prepared diet. Come on, let's go, cook out. Dr Mark Reeve isn't going to tell you which diet is better. There are pros and cons to both. But he does have one recommendation for doggy dinner time. So I think an ideal dog's diet is, is one that meets its nutritional requirements, it's balanced, and then the ingredients are consistent. So they're getting the same sorts of things. They need the same mix of macronutrients that we do. So you've got to think about sort of the right amount of protein, the right amount of fat, and then the right types of carbohydrates. And then they need to be specific to the type of animal you've got, where it is in its life stage, and, and things like that need to be taken into account. But before you ditch the tin food for something fresher, think about the impact on your wallet and the time it takes to prepare and perfectly cook two extra meals a day. There's a good reason that humans cook our food. It's because it provides so much more safety and it gets rid of things like E. coli and salmonella. And cats and dogs are just as susceptible to, to those sorts of infections. Okay. Come on, over here. They are a part of the family. Uh, I wag my tail as much as they do when I get home, you know, to see them, you know, it's, it's great. Just, they're, they're beautiful creatures. Diet devotees will tell you that feeding your dog whole foods will lead to a shinier coat, cleaner teeth and smaller, uh, poos. What we feed them is local, it's fresh. We know that it's human grade and we know, you know, that it's good for them. Most people will feed themselves whole food and feel better. So just think of that, but for your dog, so, you know, they'll be more energetic, they'll be happier, and they'll live longer. Good boy. Good boys. Trish and Tony have been feeding their fur babies a raw diet for most of their canine lives. They were so impressed with the results, they started their own pet food company. 
It's not big and scary. It's not hard to do. And it's most definitely a, um, a good move for, for everybody. Piggy, what's this? But whether you buy pre-made fresh meals or make everything in your own kitchen, anyone can do the bath diet. The trick is not to get hung up on variety. People get really worried about monotony for their pets. Um, most, especially dogs, seem to do better eating the same thing each time. We find that sometimes even just changing from one bag or one brand of food to another can be enough to cause a tummy upset. So I do think that probably keeping a fairly consistent diet is really important for your pet. If you're getting worried that they're bored, then I look at different ways to feed them. Feeding from a bowl, I think, is a really boring way to eat. And so there are lots of toys like slow feeders and other ways to feed your pet. You can hide it around the house, present it in different ways. Most dogs, though, don't have any problems eating. They're, they're all very keen to eat. Now, Joe, I always thought Dennis was pretty happy with his bit of dry food and a little bit of uh, healthy leftovers. My trouble is stopping the four kids feeding him whenever they decide that it's a good idea. That is our great challenge. It's absolutely true. Or what about when my mum, it wouldn't be unusual for her to be cooking chicken for her dog, and I'm like, what are you having for dinner, mum? I'm oh, just tin spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> like, the dog's eating better than her. Well, that's our show for today. If you'd like more information about anything on the show, you'll find it at thehouseofwellness.com.au. Now, Joe, have you got an update for us on your podcast, please? Well, the exciting news is, Darcy, that we're doing a second season of Best of You in the House of Wellness. It's going to be out January next year and we're covering everything from thriving after a breakup to breaking habits that you might not wish to have in your life. I don't know if you've got any got of those. Got a couple I'd like to uh, get rid of, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll be tuning yes. in for sure. And Caring for the Carer is one of my favourite episodes as well because carers need a little bit of support as well. But... Das, I hear that you've entered the podcast. I place. have. So download Success Without Stress, just talking about uh, how to live a life with a bit of balance and a bit of uh, stress-free, mm. Joe, while still trying to achieve at the same time. So check it out on all your favourite podcast platforms. And tune into the House of Wellness radio show with Joe and GQ every Sunday. And thanks, as always, to our great friends at Chemist Warehouse. We'll see you next time here on the House of Wellness. I love time.